Okay, colleagues, uh, I think we are about to start the session in the next uh, two to three minutes. So uh, just hang on there, please. And uh, has been like a little bit of delay in uh, New York side. As I mentioned, there has been another event going on at the same time. Uh, and they concluded a little bit later and uh, our colleagues are moving from one event to this event. So uh, most probably in the next two to three minutes, we should be starting our session. So we're about to start. I'm going to stop sharing screen. A very, 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 <laughs> very good evening, excellencies. Ambassador Aubrey Webson, Ambassador Fergal Byton, co-hosts of the event, ambassadors and representatives of permanent missions of UN agencies, private and public sector partners, friends, guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the permanent missions of Antigua and Barbuda, Ireland, the International Disability Alliance, the UN Partnership on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UN Sustainable Development Group, and the Business Innovations Group, a warm welcome to this evening's reception to celebrate the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. As they say in the airlines, we know you had other choices, so thanks for giving us your time. We are talking about more than a billion people. As of date, the SDGs have the central pledge of leaving no one behind. It does not say leaving almost no one behind, right? Or perhaps leaving no one behind. It just says leaving no one behind. Unless 1 billion people with disabilities are included, it is, but it's a no brainer, right? That will not be able to achieve any of these goals in a meaningful and substantive manner. And today we have gathered to find out some of the actions that are happening, where we stand, what are some of the solutions? Because I think over the last four or five years, the one basic shift that has happened, at least we see within the UN, is shifting from, from a narrative, narrative of why disability inclusion is important to how actually we can make it happen. And that's so much more interesting. We have a wonderful, very distinguished, as well as interesting lineup of speakers who I will soon invite for brief remarks. And then we have, I think 12 organizations you'll find around the, the room who have been working on disability inclusion. And it would be amazing to know some of the best practices, some of the initiatives and form those connections and networks which will keep us moving further ahead. Before I, I, I request the distinguished speakers, I take the opportunity to highlight a couple of points. First of all, my name is Gopal Mitra and I lead the disability inclusion team in the Secretary, executive office of the Secretary General working on the UN disability inclusion strategy. I was told to describe myself. Last time I knew I had, I'm okay, I'm an Indian male. I was told I have gray and uh, white hair or black. It is debatable whether it's more white, uh, gray or more black. I leave it up to you. I'm wearing glasses and a gray suit. <laughs> so coming to the UN disability inclusion strategy, across the street, we have had an event where we could highlight some of the, the progress. But what we have seen is over the last three years, the UN system has really come together and started addressing disability inclusion in a more 
comprehensive and systematic manner. That's the good part. The good part is also that we have made, if, if I can say so, 100% progress over the last three years, meeting 30% of the strategies benchmarks now from 16% in 2019. But we have made 100% progress, but it's still at 30% because it started from a very low base and 70% is yet to be achieved. And that's where I think the partnerships that we are talking about today, the, the collaboration of coming together is so important because nobody alone can do it. The theme of the International Day of Persons with Disabilities this year is transformative solutions and how innovations can fuel an inclusive and accessible world. In this context, I would like to take a minute to, to sit, tell you about the global strategic partnership that the Business Innovations Group is leading, which has done some wonderful work to start with, to drive some of these changes in operations in the field, in the UN country teams. The, the global strategic partnership, it leverages the business operation strategy that is being rolled out by the UN, which brings together UN agencies at the country level to bring about change in business operations. There are three main areas where the strategy is impacting. Enhancing digital accessibility, advancing physical accessibility of our premises, of our facilities in the field, and inclusive human resource services. Since we met at a similar reception in 2019, the, as a part of the, the umbrella of support under the partnership, 16 UN country teams are currently support, being supported to undertake actions to bring about change in the three areas that I just outlined. Last month, we had the, an opportunity to have a day-long dialogue with small groups of UN resident coordinators. And what, is, what was most amazing to, to hear was that from 2019, when we had a similar conversation, most of the resident coordinators who lead UN country teams had something very concrete to say on the actions they are taking to advance disability inclusion, both in programs as well as in operations. One common thread came out of those discussions where the UN country team leadership, many of them reiterated that the one solid way to bring about change in mindsets is to actually have persons with disabilities working in our office. But to do that, we know that we need our offices to be accessible. We need our digital infrastructure to be accessible. And we know that we need to change the mindsets and attitudes of, of our colleagues. So this is where the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy comes in. This is where the collaboration with, with partners come in. With the UN relies heavily on the expertise of member states, of the expertise of the private sector and the public sector to make this happen. And the, and the global strategic partnership Will, will call and rely on your expertise, including the political support as well as technical resources, as well as financial resources to make this happen. And the UN is in a unique place to deliver at scale. We're talking about 1 billion people with disabilities and we need scale. There are the, the days of pockets of good practices is over if you really want to have persons with disabilities as part of our, our, of our communities and participating equally. And the UN is so well placed to deliver that. Without further ado, I would like to first invite His Excellency, Ambassador Aubrey Webson, permanent representative of Antigua and Barbuda to give us brief remarks. 
and he and he won't need any introduction as such. All of us know him and the way he has supported disability inclusion in the UN family over the years. Over to you, Ambassador Webster. Thank you very much, Gopal. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the work you are leading within the Secretary General's office something that we feel very proud about your work, but something we feel very strong about and the role that the United Nations has, has as a leader in, this, in the global community. Excellencies and colleagues, good afternoon, good evening. It is a pleasure for me to be here tonight or this evening and for the permanent mission of Antigua and Barbuda, it is really an honor for us to host this event with our friends from Ireland. And on this very important day of persons with disability, for us, it's the second time that we are hosting this event and we're honored to be able to collaborate with all those involved. Colleagues, disability inclusion is personal to me. It is a struggle in which I have been engaged all my life. My commitment to disability inclusion and the barriers that surrounds this remains very firm. My commitment is personal as much as it is professional. I believe that disability inclusion and those barriers are not just physical, they are cultural. And by cultural, I mean cultural within every space, whether it's an office space and in organizations or cultural within communities. And those are the barriers that we have to break down in order to begin to challenge and to give meaning to leaving no one behind. We can never cease from working to, to promote diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. These are the means to, to reduce, that we have to break down in order to reduce inequalities, to promote empowerment of persons with disability, and to break the marginalization and loneliness that so many persons with disability face it daily. Through several initiatives, we have been um, able to, to make significant progress, some of which you have heard my friend Gopal already speak of in terms of the efforts that they are doing and, and as we try to advance the meaning of the CRPD globally. More, however, still needs to be done in legislation, um, as well as targeted policies and inter policy interventions, are, these are required for us to further achieve social and economic inclusion for persons with disability. Allow me to share some thoughts about the Friends of Vision, a group that I know you have heard, heard of quite a lot, Friends of Vision, co-founded and led by Ireland, Bangladesh, and Antigua and Barbuda, as we work towards addressing the problem on, of blindness and vision loss in an attempt to challenge the, and, and what, in an attempt to challenge an, an issue that can be beaten, that can be addressed right within this decade of, um, of, of the SDGs. We believe based on the resolution passed last year, um, through the effort of the Friends of Vision and many other member states, we believe that we can address and beat back this global challenge that billions of people face in vision loss, or in some cases, millions face in blindness. We, as you know, are working towards, we have, we have had the support of more than 150 
civil society and private, society, private organizations and more than 40 member states to date as we seek to work to ask the Secretary General to appoint an envoy on vision as we believe such an envoy would be an asset in the global struggle. We believe that this is a major effort and that we hope you will join us in, in promoting and pushing this. Now, as we go forward and to, uh, to support our efforts, we are addressing this in, with a number of other agencies, private sector agencies. Now through the global partnerships on disability inclusion, we would like to bring together private and public sector organizations from different fields like such as Salesforce, from the, techno from the technology and industry, that, that realm. Amtrak, and I know my good friend David is here with his colleagues from the physical accessibility realm, the International Disability Alliance, and I'm, I know they have representatives here as well, who as, who, as they represent organizations of persons with disability globally. The Kessler Foundation, the United Nations Foundation, representing the foundation realm and, and the respect, the perspectives of these, this sector, the business and innovation groups from the coordination and operations angle. These are groups that are here with us this evening that as you walk around the room in the networking, you could learn more about what they're doing to help us in this whole area to make the workplace and to make the organizations more accessible. The global partnership we believe is, 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 a, strong, is, a, is a strong part of this process. The global partnership will help us in our process um, to change by linking all of these organizations together. We cannot do it by ourselves. We need an, a, a change. We need to give meaning to leaving no one behind. And more importantly, we, we are where we are seeing, we are hearing now everywhere people give voice to the need for accessibility give voice to the need for inclusion and give voice to the need for equity. We need to live as, as, the, as Mahatma Gandhi says, we have to be the change we want to be. We need to live the change we want to see. I thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Webson for that very passionate uh, words, which also I think was followed by a lot of evidence and logic. Um, I now have the pleasure of, of inviting or giving the floor to a dear colleague and a champion and an ally of disability inclusion, Rosemary Kalapurakal, who is the deputy director of the Development Coordination Office. Rosemary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gopal. Excellencies, ambassadors and permanent representatives, colleagues and dear friends and allies of disability inclusion. The observance of this day aims to promote an understanding of disability issues and mobilize support for the dignity, rights and well-being of persons with disabilities. It also seeks to increase awareness of gains to be derived from the integration of persons with disabilities in every aspect of political, social, economic, and cultural life. I'm proud to tell you that recently, the UN system in Indonesia just shared something that we can celebrate. They've confirmed that their office elevator was upgraded to being voice enabled to help persons with disabilities. 
Their meeting room doors were upgraded to auto open so that persons in wheelchairs could access these rooms. And they incorporated dedicated accessible car parks and emergency measures in their offices. As Gopal said, my name is Rosemary Kalapurakal. I'm here not only because I'm the deputy director of the office that manages the heads of the UN at the country level, the so-called resident coordinators, and whose leadership is going to be critical to have examples like these become more the norm than the exception. I'm also here because my son is among the 1 billion. And so as Ambassador Webson said, disability inclusion is very personal to me. Also, if I have to describe myself, Gopal, I'm an no, Indian no. woman. I won't talk about the color of my hair, the real color of my hair, and I'm wearing a psychedelic suit. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you that in the UN development system, we have seized upon the momentum of the reforms that were initiated in 2019 to really create the space for walking the talk much more. For all the examples that Gopal has given and that I'm going to give you, it is a drop in the bucket of what we need to do. But because of the reform, because of the commitment of the resident coordinator system, because of the fantastic team we have in DCO working on efficiencies, as well as on disability inclusion, because of our great partnership with the executive office of the secretary general, we can say that we are actually doing much more to advance disability inclusion, looking at common services and operations, supporting coherent programming. This requires that we work at all levels to create this enabling ecosystem for inclusion and employment of persons with disabilities, including a robust policy framework, physical and digital accessibility, reasonable accommodation, awareness and capacity among our staff. And while we have started to invest in this area, we need much more coordinated action. So, I mentioned the Indonesia example, but in 16 country teams, we're already seeing proof of concept in three, four key areas. One is having accessible job fairs, working with the human rights working group and reaching out to persons with disabilities to help them understand the job opportunities, but also to help them prepare, to make sure that there are accessible venues and to let them know what reasonable accommodations are in place. We're making sure that physical accessibility is there and providing guidance. There's initial work on making our websites more uh, accessible and providing training of over 2000 staff and looking at procurement of disability accessible uh, venues. The business operation strategy has also included disability inclusion among the five high impact services to promote the SDGs and the promise of living, leaving no one behind. So in addition to looking at renewable energy, uh, fleet sharing, um, disposal of joint assets and so on, there is a uh, commitment to disability inclusion. Obviously the UN is a small player and therefore the kinds of partnerships that we are celebrating today, and I'm so grateful to the Kessler Foundation to the UN Foundation, to other private sector companies who I think will join the partnership and who are here today. The promise of what you have to offer is so important mm -hmm. because it's that kind of partnership that together with the UN's convening ability to speak up for the rights, of all, the rights and dignity of all people will make a difference to the kind of societies that we and our children live in. But we always talk about public-private sector yeah. partnerships. This, I hope, will be one of those shining examples where it really is, is real. And it's not just once a year that we uh, gather together. We have 64 UN country teams that have already adopted um, different initiatives uh, under disability inclusive common services. And as we continue to strengthen our internal leadership, coordination, and support to UN country teams for uh, results across programming and operations. We look forward to expanding these partnerships. 
There's, as um, others mentioned, there are tables around the room, and I encourage you to learn more about the kinds of progress and initiatives that are available to us. Please connect to provide additional resources for this initiative. All of this costs money. It, co it requires expertise. It requires advocacy. And so this is an area that will not just fly on its own with just nice words. But see the RC system, the resident coordinator system, for those of you who don't know, that's the system that, that leads the UN country, the UN at the uh, development system at the country level. CIAS is a strong, reliable, passionate, committed uh, partner for you. And reach out to us to know how to engage with the UN at any level so that uh, together we can take these uh, objectives forward. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosemary, for, for those words, for those, and for your leadership and the commitment. And you know, one of the things that makes me at least very hopeful is the solid commitment of, of many leaders from across the organization. You have just heard Rosemary. It was not words. The words were coming out from a, from a very deep, genuine place, right? So thank you again. Uh, I now request uh, Ms. Elaine Katz, uh, the Vice President of the Kessler Foundation, you have been instrumental in, um, in the formation of this partnership. So uh, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much, Gopal. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here this evening and I welcome everybody to this reception for the IDPD. Uh, as Gopal said, I'm Elaine Katz. I'm Senior Vice President of Grants and Communications at Kessler Foundation. And I'm wearing a, I'm a white Caucasian and I have glasses on, short hair, and I'm wearing a turquoise jacket with a black shirt underneath. We also want to extend a thank you this evening to the UN Development Coordination Office and the Business Operations Strategy for their ongoing partnership on disability. There is significant opportunity to have unprecedented impact on disability inclusion and accessibility at scale through the global infrastructure of 131 country offices. Kessler Foundation joins the world community in this day with its goal of integrating persons with disabilities in every aspect of political, social, economic, and cultural life. This year's timely theme of transformative solutions for inclusive development, the role of innovation in fueling an accessible and equitable world, reinforces the foundation's work to promote inclusion through advanced rehabilitation research, incorporating the latest in neuroimaging and robotics, and the implementation of innovative employment strategies. On this day, it is fitting to reflect on the legacy of Henry H. Kessler, MD, PhD, the rehabilitation pioneer who founded Kessler Institute in 1948. Dr. Kessler extended his early rehabilitation experience in workman's compensation in New Jersey to caring for those injured during World War II and then to the international arena, spreading the message of the importance of comprehension rehabilitation services for people with disabilities. Dr. Kessler, an orthopedic surgeon, advocating preparing people for full community participation through the development of a complete program of rehabilitation services, vocational guidance, counseling, and training. In 1950, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration launched a worldwide effort to offer advice and technical assistance to member nations who needed to establish rehabilitation services in the aftermath of the war. Dr. Kessler was appointed to implement this effort. In this capacity, he advised numerous nations, including Yugoslavia, Indonesia, the Philippines, India, and Greece. Dr. Kessler viewed collaboration on disability as a way to foster international cooperation, human development, and world peace. Kessler Foundation continues this legacy through international public-private alliances with rehabilitation researchers and technology companies in Europe, 
Canada, Asia, the Middle East, and South America. Through our research training program, young scientists from around the world gained the skills needed to advance rehabilitation science here and abroad. By building on Dr. Kessler's legacy, the advances we make through these international collaborations, presentations, and network events, such as this one hosted by the UN Today, we're enabling a world where persons with disabilities can achieve the greatest possible independence, pursue integrated competitive employment, and live with dignities within our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for those words, as well as, you know, uh, for being alongside the UN and walking shoulder to shoulder and being shoulder to shoulder in this in this work. And I would like to take the opportunity to give a shout out to, to Rick Kessler for, for, for your partnership for the support over this year. And uh, now I would like to invite for the closing remarks, Ambassador Fergal Maiten, permanent representative of Ireland to the UN uh, uh, for his remarks. And Ireland has been a key, key ally on, on, on disability inclusion. The floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Gopal. It's a real pleasure to be here. And you'll be very glad to hear on this wet and cold December evening that this is the last speech uh, before we get to mingle. Um, it's a real pleasure for Ireland to, to host this event together with uh, the Ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Aubrey, who never takes no for an answer, and rightly so, uh, and also the International Disability Alliance, the UN Partnership for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Global Partnership on Disability Inclusion. Who am I and why am I here? Well, I'm a middle-aged uh, male from Ireland. Uh, used to have ginger hair, but alas, no more. And um, <laughs> I'm the newish uh, ambassador for Ireland to the UN uh, in this town. If you're here for a few weeks, you can't use the line, I'm still new here. I'm in that space now. I came here in August and I replaced um, a real, real champion of, of the agenda for persons with disabilities, Ambassador Geraldine Bournason. And it's a real pleasure for me to follow in her first step, footsteps and to take on this work together with my colleague, John Gilroy, who's also a real champion in this space. Um, uh, and also because I'm here because this is the right thing to do. As Gopal said at the start, when we were thinking of the SDGs, and they're, they're here in, in, in graphic form behind us, it was about leaving no person behind. And that's really, really important. And I think if we reflect, it's seven years since we came together to commit to the SDGs, to commit to achieving the SDGs uh, and to commit to the, the 2030 agenda. I think it's pretty clear that we're a long, long way from achieving it. And that's a real problem for us. And we can all point to the reasons why that might be so and the excuses and all the yeah, COVID, et cetera. Uh, but it's, it's not good enough. And we're a long, long way from where we need to be. And for us here, I think it's really important that we commit, recommit to achieving the, the SDG goals. Uh, and we'll certainly in Ireland and in the Irish delegation, we'll be doing that, we'll be doing that 100% in the year to come. It's hugely, hugely important. Um, I think, uh, as I said, you know, we're a long, long way away. We know progress has been made to some extent, uh, but in some ways, and, and this is our view certainly, in, that silos may have been created in terms of implementation uh, and how we implement the goals and, and too many are being left behind, as Gopal says. And I think we need to make significant progress on disability inclusion. That must be an integral part of our approach, of our solution, if we're to get the SDGs back on track. Uh, and that's certainly what we will devote a lot of our time to uh, next year, because it's a key year leading up to the SDG summit in September, where we really have to reinvigorate the goals. Um, we also believe that our actions must go beyond, albeit very important issues such as access to premises and access to information and communications technology, but also understand how quality education, healthcare, employment, yeah. safe yeah. housing, clean water, living free of violence and stigma are all critical for advancing the rights of persons with disabilities and ensuring you're not left behind yeah. and they're not left behind. So the agenda is broad, it's ambitious, but it's really, really important. Um, and uh, as Aubrey says, 
it's not just about policies, putting policies in place. It's also about culture as well, and 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 combating that culture uh, that we that is 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 present in many many places. Um, I know I I was head of corporate services in the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs a few years ago, and we brought in policies, but actually implementing them and you know eradicating obstacles and and cultural. Uh, just resistance or cultural inertia is really difficult. It's really difficult at the micro level, at the company level, and it's really difficult on a global scale. And that's what we're talking about here, the scaling up and making this really impactful. Um, we as member states have a vital role to play uh, in highlighting the importance of these issues in the UN. Um, and I think we've seen this at first hand working with, with the ambassadors of, of uh, of Bangladesh and Antigua and Barbuda as co-chairs of the Friends of Vision of the UN. Um, and that's really, really important work. But we all know uh, the UN can't accomplish this alone. Member states can't accomplish this alone. And that's why we, we were really inspired here by the presence of, um, in, in microcosm as it were, that global partnership that is so, so important. And, and it's essential in the private sector, civil society, academia, communities of people with disabilities around the world. Uh, is critical to making the vision of the Secretary General's UN Disability Inclusion Strategy a reality. Uh, and it's just, it's just, I must say, for a Monday evening in December here, it's just really great to see that, that partnership in microcosm here. Um, that, the launch of that strategy, the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy in 2019, was an important moment. And obviously the UN is a key driver, is in a key position of leadership to lead change, to drive change in this space, um, and building on that, in June 2021, the UN Development Coordination Office, along with several key partners, formed a global strategic partnership on disability inclusion to ensure accessibility is addressed through all areas of operations. Um, I realise, as an Irish person, and I know there's some Irish people here, we speak far too fast. So apologies if, um, if I'm doing that. I'll try and slow down. Um, particularly uh, uh, for those doing, doing the, the signing, etc. But look, in conclusion, uh, I think it's really important to stress the importance of gatherings such as this, to stress the importance of this partnership, and to stress the importance of 2023 in terms of delivering on the potential of the SDGs for everyone, for everyone. And that's the key point. So we've key summits, we've key meetings, we've key consultations in, in, in early 2023, and they all provide all of us with an opportunity to inject new, new much needed momentum for the remainder of the 2030 agenda and beyond. And our aim is to ensure that the summit next September really drives on in this particular space. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, uh, for that very passionate uh, remarks and for also identifying, I mean, for, for highlighting that the SDG Summit next year is, is a key opportunity and uh, the run up to it uh, will, uh, and how we use that run up to really bring a spotlight on disability inclusion. Thanks for your commitment, for your leadership, and thanks to each one of you uh, uh, for being here again. And now is the time when you can go around these stalls and there are, there are colleagues here from UN agencies, from the private sector with a lot of, lot of uh, innovative solutions and, 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 and information and actions and what is being happening. So we hope that you will have the, the opportunity to talk to as many people, as many stalls or tables that you can visit. And on the way, do not forget to grab a drink and there are snacks too, yes. Thank you so much.